as Esther told me. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Please stand and let's sing together. Everybody glad it's Labor Day weekend. You got a three-day weekend. I know the teachers are probably thrilled. They had a couple weeks, and now they get an extra day off at the beginning of the week. So we're glad to see you all. I hope you're enjoying the fair this weekend. It's got kind of hot, but we had a nice, cool week. But uh, a lot of exciting things going on in DuCoin. One of our own young men here in this uh, sanctuary has had an opportunity to use his foot very, very fre frequently these last two weeks. Mr. Wood has been very busy as the extra point kicker this year, which we like to see, and a lot of good things happening with our high school athletics, from the volleyball to the football, and have some successful athletes in this church, especially in cross country as well. So if you see a chance to get around these young kids that are doing special things, make sure to take a few moments to pat them on the back and tell them that you notice and how proud you are of them and, and the success they're having, because not all kids get that as much as we'd like. So it's better to assume that they just never get it and go out of your way to encourage them than just to assume that, ah, somebody else is doing it. So we're glad you guys are here. I'm going to say a blessing to open up, and after that, we're going to do, uh, we're going to have a time of greeting. This is your time. If you don't know somebody sitting close to you, if you haven't seen them in a while, make sure that, that you make them feel welcome. Make sure that they want to come back because of the way you treated them, the way you visited with them and talked to them this morning. And I know on a weekend like this, we always have visitors because I see some unfamiliar faces. So make sure to go out of your way and greet those around you. Are there any special announcements we need to talk about? Oh, I got one. I got one. We've kind of had a week off last six weeks or eight weeks. I'm not sure what it was. We had an open meeting um, instead of the traditional Sunday school in the Family Life Center where we just had six or eight tables. Anybody could come, any age, no restrictions. Just come, sit at a table, be a part of a group discussion. We had like a a lesson led by two fine men in this church, Matt Schaub and Sean File, and uh, then the groups kind of broke up. We're going to do something a little different starting next week, um, which is going to include one fine man and then an average Joe after that. Gary Stanhouse is going to be leading that, and then when Gary's not able to, you'll be stuck with me. But the saving grace is we're going to watch a short video this time. 
And then after the video, we're going to get together in our groups, do some discussion. If you're not a part of a Sunday school class, if you just never got in there to get to be part of a Sunday school class, if you're thinking about coming to Sunday school, come meet us in the fellowship hall there. And uh, anybody is welcome. There's no age restrictions, old, young, whatever it is. We want you to come be a part of it. The idea is to get you in there for six or eight weeks and then find a Sunday school class you can transition to. But I swear if they let me talk, I'll do my best to make it fun and exciting. And you'll hear things maybe in church you've never heard before. So <laughs> don't tell Joe I said that. Right? So let's pray and then greet each other. Dear Lord, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the the group of believers we have together and the opportunity to come together and worship you. We thank you for the blessings in our lives and in our community and especially the blessings in our church. We ask that we be good stewards of the gifts you've given us and the money that you give us to support your kingdom and promote your kingdom. And I hope you're with us in all that we do. Let our ears hear what Joe has to say today and be with the worship team as they bring us to a place of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's greet each other. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies And if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside but There's a better life There's a better life If you've got pain He's a pain taker If you feel lost He's a way maker If you need freedom or saving He's a prison shaking savior If you've got chains He's a chain breaker We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight We've all run to things we know just ain't right When there's a better life, there's a better life If you've got pain He's a pain taker If you feel lost He's a way maker And if you need freedom or saving He's a prison shaking savior If you've got chains He's a chain breaker If you believe 
receive it If you can't feel it Somebody testify If you believe it If you receive it If you can't feel it Somebody testify, testify If you believe it If you receive it He's a chain breaker In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise forever to 
praise forever to the King of Kings. I've been held by A prodigal return All my hope is in Jesus Thank God that yesterday is gone Yeah, all my sins are forgiven I've been stranger to prison I've worn shackles and chains but I've been freed and forgiven and I'm not going back I'll never be the same that's why I sing Breaks him down to his knees God, I've been broken more than a time or two Yes, Lord, but then you picked me up And showed me what it means to be a man Oh, my hope is in Jesus Thank God that yesterday is gone given us. We thank you for the sacrifice Jesus made. We ask that you will move here today, Lord, that you will prepare us all here to hear from you, to receive from you. We ask that you will clear any distractions that will keep that from happening today, Lord. We ask that you be with Joe as he comes, give him your word, give him boldness, wisdom, and strength, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, well, good morning. If you are four years old through fourth grade, you can exit right out this door. We've got Children's Church for you. If you don't know where they're going, they'll go right up these stairs here, and uh, they'll be up at the very top of these stairs, and you can pick them up right there after uh, church is over, all right? All right, well, it's good to see you this morning. You know what? We've had a good weekend. Let me tell you why. Those Indians won on a nail biter against the Harrisburg, and that was good. Wasn't that good? You like to see that? And then the SIU, they won. Child won. That was a good one. Wasn't it? We beat them. And then uh, the Auburn Tigers won. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
Well, listen, we're glad you're here. You go ahead if you want to. Turn your Bible, Matthew 6. We'll get there in a few minutes. Let me set this up. So if you hadn't been with us, here's what we've been talking about. We've been talking about the fact that as Christians, you know, the devil's out to, to destroy us. And what he, how he mostly does it is he's the father of lies and he likes to tell lies. And so he, you know, he's a deceiver. And so what's he, what he likes to do is just drop lies on us. And then we sometimes accept those things and, and we live with that. And, and what it does, it, he, he tells us those to destroy us, right? And so we've been looking at some of those different lies. And today, what I want to do, I want to end this series with, with this. Um, this is going to be probably not your favorite sermon um, due to the content, but I think I think it'll serve us well this morning. I want to talk about the subject of forgiveness. And um, so I want to talk a little bit about that. And I want you to do me a favor. As we get ready to start this morning, I want you to think about the worst thing that someone's ever done to you. What was the worst thing that's ever been done to you? Now, let me ask you, are you there yet? You got it in your mind? Right? Um, The thing that was so bad that right now, if you could, you might even take a swing at that person. It was pretty bad, right? And uh, some of you right now are thinking of some pretty terrible things because what's been done to you? Things that you maybe right now you've been living with for years. And the question is, how do you forgive that thing, right? Or, and should you? Like, like, for instance, what if someone's been lying to you or, or they betrayed you or they publicly humiliated you? Right? Or, 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 or maybe you've, you, this morning you've been hurt, you've been wronged, you've been taken advantage of really bad. Like I've talked to people in my office over the years who've been mistreated or betrayed, you know, by their spouse. Or maybe they've been betrayed or, or, or um, abandoned by their parents or by their kids. So here, here's the question this morning. To forgive them would be foolish, right? All that hurt they caused? Um, and several years ago, um, this story happened. I want to I give you this to begin with as, as we think about this. There was a guy by the name of Terry Anderson. You probably never heard of him because it happened so long ago. I was, I was barely born. It's 1985. Um, but in 1985, there was a guy by the name of Terry Anderson, and he gets kidnapped by Hezbollah. He was an associated um, reporter, and he worked for Associated Press. And so he gets kidnapped, and he was, in the process, he was, he was kidnapped, or he was in holding for seven, almost seven years. They put him in a, in a terrible cell infested with spiders. He suffered through sickness, through mental torture, emotional torture, he, and, and the whole time he longed to see his family. And through the whole ordeal, they give him one book to read. Guess what the book was? Not the Koran, but the Bible. They give him the Bible to read. And so he, he goes through the Bible, and he's devouring it for some hope. And in the process, he comes to these outrageous words in the Bible. Um, you, you'll know this. It said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, let me just pause right there. Can you imagine how crazy that sounded to Terry Anderson? Right? Especially, now he spent 2,455 days, you know, locked up, imprisoned. Think about this. He reads those words and he's like, pray for who? Pray for my enemies? Where's the punchline, right? Well, it's interesting, on December 4th, 1991, Terry gets released. And and he gets off the plane in America and all these reporters are surrounding him. And they're asking him all these questions. They ask him, like, what'd you do all those days They ask him, um, they ask him, what are you going to do in the future? And then one reporter asked him this question, and it just, they said it just floored him. He said, can you forgive your captors? 
And Anderson pauses for a second. And before the answer would come out of his mouth, he said that he thought of the Lord's Prayer. And he thought of these words in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who sins against us. And he said, he said, he just thought for a second, and this victim, this guy that had been imprisoned for, for nothing, says to the reporter, he says, yes, I'm a Christian, and I'm required to forgive, no matter how hard it might be. I thought about, wow. Dude, that is an answer right there, isn't it? So here's, here's what the enemy will tell you. The enemy will tell us things like, ah, forgiveness is overrated, right? Forgiveness is not all it's cracked up to be. I mean, it's for people like Billy Graham, who's on a mission, yeah, maybe him, but us normal people, people who live in the real world, we can't afford to forgive, right? It sets us up to hurt again. And besides all that, there are just some things in life that shouldn't be forgiven. Anybody heard that in your head before? Actually, there's a couple other lies that go with this, and I, I wanted to give them to you. Here's another one that devil will drop in your head with forgiveness. He'll tell you, if you forgive them, then you're condoning their behavior. Anybody heard that one? Like if you forgive, if, if, well, let me change the names. How about, so the thinking goes something like this. If I forgive Gertrude, then I might as well be saying that what they did to me was no big deal, right? And I can't afford to forgive Gertrude because um, I'll be condoning their actions, so I can't forgive them. Right? Some people think like that. Forgiveness is hard because it can often feel like you're letting somebody off the hook. Or how about this one? If you forgive them, then you also have to forget it. Right? How many times have you been told that you need to forgive and forget anybody? But how do you forget a rape? How do you forget infidelity? How do you, how do you forget those things? If you forgive, then you've, you're going to have to restore that relationship with them as well. And, and think about this. If forgiveness requires you to be friends and start spending time with the offender, well, then forget it. I'm not doing that. I never want to see this person again. And what if that person has died? What if the person's died? Well, then, then I guess forgiveness is just out of the question then, right? Well, here's the truth. I want you to think about this for a second. Forgiveness is one of the sweetest gifts that one human can give another. Right? Uh, it's a mental, it's, it's emotional, it's an act of grace that may be, it's, that's really unmatched in its implications for life for both the offender and the forgiver. And listen, here's where I want to go with this. I want you to hear me. If you don't hear nothing else, it's not optional for Christians. Ooh, Joe. You already went there? Now, Jesus requires us to forgive. And, I, and now get, get to Matthew 6 real quick, and I want to show you a scripture, verse 14 and 15. Jesus is going to say this, and, and, and no matter how significant or frequent the offense, he, he says we got to forgive. Listen to what he says here. He says this, and I'm, I'll sum it up, and then I'm going to read it. He basically says if you're not willing to forgive others, then you're not going to be able to experience the fullness of, of God's forgiveness in your own life. He says this, verse 14 and 15, chapter 6 of Matthew. If you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I just got to tell you, is that not a hard scripture? Anybody here thinking of something really bad that's been done to you? And then you read this. See, having a forgiving heart, though, is, is essential to, to Christian living, right? Um, the, the word forgiveness means this. It can mean to send forth, to let go of, to let go free, to cancel a debt. How many of you have heard this? 
How many of you have heard, I'm gonna, somebody do something bad to you and you go, I'm going to get even? Anybody said that before? Remember when you, no, I, I, anybody remember that? <laughs> I won't go there. You know why you got to say, I want to get even? Because there's been a debt incurred to you. So we say, we, I'm going to get even. I'm going to do something back to them to make it equal. And what forgiveness is, is canceling that debt, that offense. That's, that's what it is. I, I like what C.S. Lewis said. He says, everyone says that forgiveness is a lovely ideal until they have something to forgive. Sounds really good in, in theory, doesn't it? This morning, I want to go back to where we started. I want to ask you to name someone who you need to forgive. You got that person yet? Who's the person that you need to forgive? And I guarantee you, if you really thought about it, everybody in here can come up with a name. It could be uh, that that offense just seems unforgivable to you. You know, I'll tell you this. Peter apparently had somebody he was thinking of. Turn over to Matthew 18. I want to show you this. So, so Peter has this person he's thinking of, and he wants to, here's his question. He wants to know, when is it enough? When is it that you don't have to forgive anymore? Right? When's it okay not to forgive someone? Because you got, you got all these stories of rape, you know, murder, unfaithfulness. So when is it okay not to forgive? So Peter's going to ask Jesus this question. Now, Matthew 18, you guys are familiar with this. Verse 21, check it out. He says, then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus says, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, let me just pause right there for a second. Doesn't that sound pretty logical? Someone does something wrong to you, and you give them up to seven chances. Sounds pretty reasonable, right? Seven chances. Sounds like a lot. But then after that, you can take them by the throat out into the parking lot and beat the snot out of them. <laughs> right? Sounds reasonable. Now, 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 Peter comes up with this seven figure, and I did some reading on it. In the Jewish belief system, seven's kind of a, a perfect number. It's a number of completion. So a lot of people think that what he, when he says seven times, he's talking about forgiving someone seven times, and then you've completed what you need to do. You're done. You know, that you've done everything that you need to do. You're done. Now, it's interesting because what I also read was that the rabbis taught that you, all you had to do is forgive somebody three times. So Peter goes like double that. He goes, actually, it's a little bit more than double but he goes to seven, seven times, right? And then Jesus, though, turns and he says to him this. He says, 70 times seven. Now, so he asked Jesus, how, how many times are forgiven? And Jesus says, 70 times seven. Now, if my math is correct, that's 490 times. But I don't think that's the point. His point is to not keep track of the offenses, when we're going to forgive someone, we don't, we don't keep track. And then he goes on to tell us here why we don't need to, give tr to keep track. Now, I want you to read with me because what he's going to do for Peter and for all of us, he's going to tell a story, right? And you may be familiar with this story. Check it out. It's, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, starting in verse 23. He says, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife, children, and all that he had, and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion, and he released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him, and he began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling, and he went through him in prison until he should pay him back what he owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved, and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. 
Then summoning him, his Lord said, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I've had mercy on you? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should have repaid all that he owed. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each one of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Now, again, let's, let's kind of walk through this so we don't miss anything. First, there's this king, and he decides one day in his kingdom that he's going to settle all the accounts of everybody that owes him something. And up comes this guy who had a particularly high debt. In fact, Jesus describes it as 10,000 talents, right? And he uses the word talent there because it was the largest denomination they had back then was a talent. And so we kind of need to know what that is. The servant, by the way, owed 10,000 of them. That's more debt than anybody could imagine in those days. It's a lot of money. Like, we don't know how it happened. Um, he, we don't know if he got on the boat, got crazy. I don't know what happened, but he, he's got 10,000 talents he owes. One talent back then, a lot of people have different ways to calculate this, but w- one guy that I like said this. It's like, it's like 6,000, let's see, 6,000 days of work. It would take, in other words, 13 years to pay off one talent. 13 years working six days a week to pay off one talent. He owed 10,000 of them. You think about how much that, how could, it, how could he, well, dude was a bad money, a money manager, right? Think about it. You're going to take your money to him? This guy's, this guy's can't. Here, by the way, if that's correct and exactly how much a talent was, you know how long it would take him to pay off all this debt? 130,000 years. That's a long time. I don't think he's paying it off. How about you? Right? So it's beyond what anyone could pay. This guy's unable to pay, so here's what the king does. All right, so I'll tell you what. He owes me all this. He's he's never going to be able to pay it back, so I'll just sell him, sell his wife, sell his kids, sell the minivan, sell the instant crock pot thing, Instapot, sell the side-by-side, sell his lake where he fishes, his boat, everything. Sell it all. Right? And th- this guy gets down on his knees the, the, in, the, in the story and he begs for mercy. He begs for forgiveness. And he promises that he'll pay. And there's this shocking moment that happens in the story. Here's the king with the guy standing right on his knees and he takes his page out of the book. He rips it out and he takes it, he rips it up and he goes, whoosh. He says, You owe me nothing. You're good. You don't, you don't owe a thing. Your bill's been paid. You're free and clear. Go in peace. Right? Can you imagine, just for a second, how that servant would feel? I bet he clicked his heels. I bet he started singing that song, I'm happy like a room without a roof. Now you know why I don't sing. I bet, I bet he was excited, don't you? Don't you think you'd be pumped if you owed 130,000 years worth of work and somebody said, you don't owe me anymore? I bet, he was, I bet he was pumped, right? He's experiencing freedom. The weight of all of that debt was on his shoulders and now there's nothing. And he walks out and he's a free man. And he's probably, I don't know what he was doing. He's, he was happy though. He gets outside of the palace in Jesus' story, and he runs into a guy that owes him $5.11. And he looks at the guy, and he grabs him by the throat, and he says, hey, you owe me $5.11, and I want the 11 cents too. The guy goes, oh, well, I ain't got the money. I'll, I'll pay you on Tuesday. Gladly pay you, you know, <laughs> gladly pay you on Tuesday. And it's interesting, you'll notice that in this story, everything that that guy just did inside the palace, this guy's now doing. He's on his knees, he's begging for mercy, he's asking for forgiveness, and he says, I'll pay you back. But there's this crazy twist in Jesus' story, right? And the twist is this, this servant did everything opposite that the king did, right? And and Jesus says here, depending on your version, he says, He refused to show patience. And in the language of the day, what happened was this guy 
made a conscious choice to harden his heart. After all that, he just walks out of the king's palace and he refuses and he hardened his heart. He didn't give him more time. He didn't give him anything. He, he summoned the police officer and said, arrest him. Take him to jail. He owes me $5.11 and he hasn't paid me. Go to, go to jail. Now, the guy gets dragged off to jail. All the buddies that were outside watching this, watch this happen, and they're like, what's wrong with this dude? So they go tell the king. And the king, guess what the king does when he finds out the guy throws another, his buddy in jail for $5.11 after he just forgave him 130,000 years worth of, worth of debt. He's incensed. He's mad. He calls him in and look at verse 32 and 33. He says this, you wicked slave, I forgave you all your debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I have a mercy on you? So he calls him in and he just lets him have it. And then it says he, he sells him, right? He sells him off. Let me, let me make some parallels here, all right, because we've got to move on. The king in, the, in Jesus' story is God. Right? The parallel is that. In other words, forgiveness, y'all, always begins with God. Can I get a witness? Right? And this servant is all of us. We're the servant. Right? We owe a debt, a debt of sin that we can't pay. Right? And our little attempts to pay the debt is just ridiculous. All we got in our account is zeros. Just zeros. That's it. Um, and yet... The king's great love, God's great love, he forgives this astronomical debt. I love the scripture, um, Psalm 133 and 4 says, If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. There's forgiveness. And in this story, Jesus cannot understand how a, regener a Christian man or woman, a person whose sins caused Jesus to be nailed to the cross, right, could turn around and refuse to forgive a debt, infinitely smaller in comparison to what he forgave. He's, he's like, I, I don't see how that could, that could happen. I like what C.S. Lewis said. He said, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in us. Now, why does Jesus require, or, or, or uh, why does he require us to forgive? Well, first, because he forgives us. Now, there's a, ver there's a verse I just want you to read. I I'll read it. You can turn there if you want. It's Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 12. Kind of answers it. Here's what it says. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all, put on love, which is, binds everything together in perfect harmony. I don't know if you notice that six-word little phrase sentence right there in the middle. It said this, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. I want you to think about this. How far... Did forgiveness go for you? Right? How much are we then expected to forgive? According to this, where does the line drawn where offenses don't have to be forgiven? Here's the answer. It's kind of simple. To the degree that God is willing to forgive us, we're supposed to forgive others. Right? And, and, and the wonderful reality is this, is that God will forgive anything, right? Think about it. You can't get so dirty. We already talked about this. You can't get so dirty that, that God uh, won't accept you. He always will forgive if we ask. And as forgiven children, we're expected to forgive others, right? And to accept, to, to accept God's forgiveness and not to offer it back is, is in short, just hypocritical, Amen. Now, I know I'm talking to Baptists. I'll just, I'll just leave that. 
Here, here's the thing. Let me, let me give you some, a couple things to think about. If you don't forgive, let me tell you where it's going to lead. Are you ready? If you refuse to forgive, and some of you are there, it'll lead to bitterness. It, it, it just will. It'll, it'll lead to, to, to bitterness. And generally, here's the thing about bitter people. Bitter people have good reasons to be angry. Most of the time, not all the time, um, because that sin could be pretty catastrophic. Like it could be adultery, it could be abuse, it could be some kind of, I mean, I could go through a lot of different sins. Or maybe the sin wasn't a big deal on the outside, but it hurt a lot because, it, because the person who did it, that matters too. A lot of people are bitter because who did it. Sometimes the worst pain is betrayal. Anybody here ever been betrayed? How'd that feel? Did you like it? See, bitterness is often related to, to how much you love the offender. Like if, 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 if your neighbor or a stranger sins against you, that's not as big a deal. But if someone that you really love sins against you, that's, doesn't that hurt? Right? So think about that. Those you love most likely are the ones that can hurt us the worst. And if bitterness, y'all, is not exchanged for forgiveness, let me tell you what happens. What happens is this, is that bitterness develops a root and it gets inside you and it splashes on everything and everyone around you. See, here's what I know. Some of you in here, you're, or maybe it's your spouse or whatever, you're bitter. You've been wronged. Maybe, the, maybe the, the wrong was terrible, but what's happened is you haven't forgiven and then bitterness got inside of you and, and it is just, it's wrecking everything. It's wrecking your family. It's wrecking your friends. Everyone. In fact, here's a verse for you. Hebrews 12, 15 says this. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And then listen to what he says. And by it, many become defiled. That's what bitterness does. That's what unforgiveness does. Unforgiveness turns into bitterness, which, def which splashes on everybody. So he says, be careful. Don't go there. Now listen, you say, well, Joe, wait, wait a minute. Uh, so how do I forgive? How do I forgive? Now, I want to give you a couple things to think about here. I didn't, I didn't make this up, but I, I want to give it to you this morning. And the first thing is this. One is pray for perspective. Right? Um, ask God to give you a 50-year view of, of your hurt. See, when, listen, when you're in pain, when you've been hurt, it's easy to lose the perspective of, of the big picture of your life. It's easy to see yourself never moving beyond that particular hurt. So here's what you got to start with. Start with praying for a perspective. And as you move towards forgiveness, what happens is ask God to show you his point of view of what's going on. Pray, for your, pray to see the view of your life in 20 years or, 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 or 40 years. And with God's help, you won't see yourself still limping along. What you'll see is instead yourself being whole and free. See, God's plan for you is not to, to limp along like that, but to give him it. And in fact, I love what Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. See, God's desire is for us to live in, in victory in our Christian life. And if you keep that for unforgiveness, you'll never get there. So pray for a perspective. Secondly, and I think this is a, something to think about, fully weigh and evaluate the loss. So, so think about this, because this is just like a brutal step, right? You can't fully extend forgiveness until you come to grips with the extent that you've been hurt. So in some cases, that's, it's not a big deal. Like if your neighbor runs over your petunias, it's not that big a deal, right? You just go over and pick some flowers out of his yard and plant them back. <laughs> but 
what happens when the offense is, you know, adultery? Or, or, or you know, the cheated, or, or, or murder, or, or what if it's betrayal, something like that? See, what the temptation is, is just kind of skim over that and, and, and not, not talk about how bad it is in order to, to avoid pain, because it's just pain avoidance. Um, but if you do that, here's what happens, is, is you'll miss the healing in it. So, so what I said is this, just lean into that. And, and I like what he said. If you completely want to be healed, then you have to fully own what's taking place. So what, he's, what one writer said to do is, is just write out. Write out the hurt. Write it out what it is, the offense. And then don't hold it. You're not, look, you don't do that to hold it over the person's head. You do that to adequately grieve the loss and then to adequately forgive. And then the last thing is this. The third thing is fully extend forgiveness. Right? Um, and this is the most uh, critical step is to do this. Is What this does is this frees the offender from the debt he or she has committed against you. And that process doesn't take place until, if possible, you look that person in the eye and say, listen, I'm not going to hold this against you anymore. I cancel the debt. Listen to me. That moment of pardon if that takes place, and maybe it needs to take place today, is without exception one of the most powerful relational moments that you will ever experience in your life. Let me go back to where we started several weeks ago. Jesus comes and, and he, he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll what? I'll give you a rest. So let me ask you this. Today, this morning, what grievance are you holding on to? What is it that's, that you're just, you will not forgive? Who is it th this morning that you need to forgive? Here's what Jesus said. My yoke is easy and my burden is what? Yeah. Y'all, isn't it time to take that heavy burden of unforgiveness and take it off and take Jesus's burden that is light instead? What do you think? Right? It's, it's time for you to forgive. Come to Christ and here's what he promises, that he will heal that wound. Don't keep holding on to it. You know what? You'll be surprised at how light you feel if you do actually forgive them. Now, I, I get this, and in a room like this, maybe you've realized today that you've actually never experienced God's forgiveness, and that's why you can't forgive someone. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you've never given your life to Christ. Here's what I'll tell you. You can accept him today, and here's the gospel in a nutshell. The gospel is this, y'all, that we're sinners and we're separated from God, and so uh, God had to do something. And so he sends his son, Jesus Christ, to come to this earth. He lived a perfect life, a life that you and I could never live. And then he dies the death that you and I should have died. He takes our place at the cross. He didn't die for him. He died for us, the Bible says. And then it says on the third day that he rose again to prove who he was and what we're supposed to do. What the scripture says is we got to give a response to that. And the response is to trust and believe in him. That he can take everything and, and save you. He can take it all. All the debt, all that off of you. And what he says is you put your faith and trust in him. That's how a person's saved. So if you've never done that this morning, there's a call for you today to be saved, to give your life to Jesus Christ. If you've done that, remember we talked about this several weeks ago. What do we do? We live the Christian life the same way we came to him. We surrender. We give him our hurts, our, our, um, all these things that people have done, and we say, God, I, 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 I need your help. Help me forgive them. And the Bible says when we surrender to him, he helps us. He gives us the strength to do that, and it feels great. And he takes the loads off of us. And he makes us light and free. 
He's a chain breaker. <laughs> so I don't know where you are today. I don't know what it is you're going through, and I bet it's some bad stuff. But here's what I do know. That Christ is here, and he's able to take that from you and give you his life. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you a moment this morning just to kind of respond. So I'm going to ask you, if you would, to bow your head. I want to give you just a few minutes here to, just to think. You know, I'm going to pray, and then we're, we're just going to have a, a time of, of uh, just to respond and reflect. And so let me pray for us, and then we'll give us, give us all a chance to talk to the Lord. So if you, if you need to talk to him right now, you can do that. But let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we come to you. And Lord, I'm so thankful that you've forgiven me. And so many of us, God, we struggle with unforgiveness. It's hard, Lord. And right now, I know there's some folks that are struggling because there's some things that have been done to them that are terrible. And, and it's destroying them. And so, Lord, I pray that this morning, during this time, that they would lay that down at the foot of the cross at your feet, Lord. Lord, I pray for the one here that may not know you personally. They've never come to, to the place where they, they've given their life to you fully, Lord. They've never been forgiven of their sin. And to this morning, they feel that tug. They feel the Holy Spirit just drawing them. To, and so, Lord, if that's a person here today, that they would come and they would talk to one of us, a deacon or, or, or me or, or someone, Lord, and they would find out how they may be saved. Lord, I pray that in the next few minutes that your spirit would just be on this place, that you would be drawing people unto you. People would be getting free. So Lord, have your way, and we pray this in your name. Amen. So I'm going to ask you if you would to stand with me. As so we come to this invitation song, this is for you. If you want to come and maybe you want to pray at the altar, it's open. If you need to make a decision public, maybe you need to follow the Lord in baptism. You want to find out how to join this church or find out how you can be saved. I'll be here. There'll be some other deacons and pastors here. So whatever you need to do this morning, as this song plays, you talk, you talk to God and you do what he's wanting you to do. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned, I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again, amazing love, how can Amazing love, I know 
Amen. Again, thanks for being here today. I pray that you're blessed. I pray that maybe that person that you're thinking of, you can forgive them. If you haven't, I hope it kicked you real good, and, and maybe you will. I don't know. God bless you. Have a great day today. Um, we start back Wednesday nights. I just wanted to mention this. Uh, not this coming Wednesday, but the next one. We're going to have uh, our supper at 5 if you'd like to come and have supper. And, and we have a Bible study that starts at 6 for different ages. and different. All, there's four adult classes going. And then we've got uh, children's. Different children are split up. And we got preschool. And we got nursery. And we got youth. So we got something for everybody. So I uh, hope that you'll... Uh, be a part. If you'd like to be put on the, the Wednesday night supper list, call the church office and they'll do that. All right. God bless you. Have a great day. Um, let me think here. Is there anything else? I don't think so. Steve, come and close us out. Steve's our deacon of the week. We appreciate his service here to First Baptist. He's a blessing. Pray with me, please. Father, we just thank you for your word today. We thank you for forgiving us, Lord. And I pray that through the power of your spirit and through your love, Lord, that we can extend that grace to others. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.